Hello! In this video I wanted to talk a little bit about entrepreneurship and entrepreneurial strategy when you're um, doing your startup in a developing economy context. And I realize that a lot of you out there are not doing your startup within the US or within Europe. You're doing startups in countries that are still developing where the entrepreneurial environment and the business environment might be quite different. And so I'm here in China at a conference, the inaugural conference on entrepreneurship and innovation relevant to China. And I want to thank my colleagues at um, Wuhan University and at Lancaster for putting on this conference. A lot of my own research is related to entrepreneurship in a developing economy context and has focused on entrepreneurship within China. And so I wanted to take a few minutes and talk a little bit about how entrepreneurship and, and your strategy as an entrepreneur might be different in a developing economy context. And so the first thing that I want to emphasize is that I think that um, entrepreneurship and particularly technology-based entrepreneurship spreading around the world is really a great thing. I think that as more uh, people and more economies learn about the entrepreneurship process and begin to foster it, this economic competition can only be beneficial uh, to society and to the world overall. And so this is one of the reasons why I wanted to do this class online is to um, try and increase innovation and entrepreneurship around the world. I think if you're um, the second thing is I just wanted to show you a brief uh, view out the window as uh, the conference includes a cruise down the Yangtze River. And so um, we're here on our way to Chongqing uh, from Wuhan and you can see it raining out there and, and the Yangtze River as we've gone down the Three Gorges Dam. So the first thing, if you're thinking about becoming an entrepreneur in a developing economy context, I think is that you really have to prepare yourself well, uh, both in terms of work experience and mentally for the challenges ahead. In terms of work experience, many entrepreneurs in a develop developing economy tend to be younger and tend to have uh, relatively little work experience. And I think that this actually um, uh, means that if you can gain a bit of work experience, you have a really big advantage. And in particular, you want to try and work in uh, an entrepreneurial company that's quickly growing and has had some success um, that's in the industry that you're thinking about doing a startup in. So for example, in the Chinese context, uh, if you can go and, and work for a, a Sohu.com or, or a Baidu or an Alibaba, uh, some company that has had some success but is still quickly growing, this is going to give you an advantage for several reasons. One, it's going to teach you more about the market. Uh, two, it's going to enable you to have an easier time finding your initial co-founders, teammates, and early hires. These kinds of entrepreneurial firms tend to attract other individuals who are also interested in entrepreneurship and thinking about maybe starting up their own company. And so because recruiting talent is relative and recruiting co-founders is relatively more difficult in a developing economy, working in one of these firms and having a set of teammates and co-workers that you can work together on entrepreneurial ideas with and potentially be your initial co-founders and early hires can give you a real advantage. The second thing is that you want to, working in one of these companies allows you to potentially find mentors who can help you in the startup process. So if, if you've been working at an entrepreneurial firm that's been somewhat successful, see if you can get one of the more senior executives uh, in the company to begin mentoring you. And they might be a terrific advisor once you leave and decide to start your own firm. It can also be a source of a network for learning the entrepreneurship process and also a network uh, for potential fundraising. The second thing I think you want to do, besides getting work experience, is to find some entrepreneurship club or some support group. Uh, a lot of the society and maybe your parents are going to tell you that entrepreneurship 
is not really a legitimate career or is not really something that you should be doing with your time. And so you need some support group socially of fellow entrepreneurs that you can get together with and, and who will help encourage you and, and help you get past the difficult times. The second thing that I wanted to talk about a little bit is fundraising. And often fundraising is more difficult in a developing economy because resources are more limited and a greater share of the resources are controlled by the government. The um, typical sources of funding that you want to look for first are your own personal savings that hopefully you've accumulated during this period of work experience. Your own personal savings and money from friends and family are going to be your most likely initial sources to get the business off the ground. After that, after you've begun the entrepreneurship process and, and begun um, a lot of what we've talked about in the course in terms of testing your business model, then you can start to reach out to angel investors, high net worth, wealthy individuals who have perhaps been successful as entrepreneurs themselves and are interested in providing funding to the next generation of entrepreneurs. So these high net worth individuals known as angel investors are going to be a likely first source of funding. You might also have early stage venture capitalists uh, that are uh, nearby. If so, then, then you can start to approach them uh, as well, particularly once you've already got some customers and got some users going. Banks or later stage venture capitalists are going to, going to be a less likely source of funding, particularly in developing economies. Uh, banks are, are very hesitant, even in developed economies, banks are very hesitant to loan to entrepreneurial firms. If you're having trouble uh, with fundraising, then you also want to go back and um, think very hard about your business model and about whether you're um, doing the right hypothesis testing and, and think about iterating or changing your business model a bit. Difficulty raising funding can be due to challenges in the financing in environment, but it can also be due to the fact that you haven't thought through your business model well enough and you haven't made quite enough progress yet in uh, getting some users or developing uh, your business model further. And so it might require you to go back and, and rethink that. And now, once you've got the startup uh, going, then getting growth financing can also be difficult. And so you want to think a lot about bootstrapping the startup and whether you can use the revenues as, as a source of future growth because sometimes getting money to expand the business is also difficult in, a, in an emerging economy particularly if state-owned enterprises and state-run banks control a lot of the resources. The next thing after fundraising that I wanted to talk a little bit about is uh, the influence of ties to government officials in a developing economy context. And particularly if the economy has uh, undergone transition from, from more state planning, then often ties to government officials can be uh, particularly important. But one thing that I want to emphasize is that while having some tie to a government official can be helpful in getting uh, various regulatory approvals or getting access to information, it can also be a double-edged sword uh, if you're um, spending too much time on uh, connecting with government officials and not enough on understanding your customers and understanding the market, um, then other competitors who understand the market better and have a product that's more tailored to uh, what customers really want will wind up having an advantage. And so the amount of time and percentage of your uh, day that you spend um, trying to build relationships with government officials should to some extent be determined by the, the state of uh, development of the market orientation of the economy. If it's relatively early in development, then you may need to spend more time networking with government officials. Um, if, the, if the country has developed more market-based institutions and more of the competition is in the product market, then you need to think a bit more about your business model and, and maybe reduce the amount of time that you spend um, networking and building relationships with government officials. 
The next thing, um, a little bit of my research, particularly with the, one of the PhD students, has been on uh, the role of science parks. And we've found that being located in a science park can help give you some advantage, uh, particularly if you lack ties to government officials. So the science park can act as an intermediary and help uh, give you a more protected environment. And so one strategy, if you lack those important connections to government officials, is to locate in a science park that does have some government connections. Next, the fifth thing that I wanted to talk about after the science park is uh, copycats. And particularly in China and often in developing economies, entrepreneurs are hesitant and particularly hesitant to take more of an innovation strategy because they're worried about copycats. And this is a natural thing. As competition increases in the market, you're going to have more competitors and more firms who are perhaps copying your products, particularly as you become more successful. And so the strategy in dealing with copycats is one, you want to really build a culture in your, in your organization from the beginning of respect for intellectual property and make sure that the employees want to stay and, and be entrepreneurial within your company as opposed to going out and building a copycat. Second, this is another reason why it's very important to uh, build and maintain a culture of continuous innovation. If you're just competing based on cost and constantly trying to cut costs and cut corners, then you're going to wind up in a situation where you have very low profit margins and competition is very difficult. But if you focused along the way on also doing a bit of R&D and trying to introduce some new products and continuously improve on the products that you have, then you're going to continuously have a leg up on those copycats and, and competitors and, and stay a step ahead of them. And so I think uh, having some focus on innovation, either process innovation or new products, um, can really give you a leg up against the competition uh, in a developing economy. Competing against state-owned enterprises is another thing. Uh, this can often be very difficult if you're trying to compete head-to-head -head against a state-owned enterprise in your industry. Often it can be an easier strategy to be a supplier or to sell some technology into a state-owned enterprise. Um, this is a situation that's going to vary from country to country and industry to industry and, and hopefully your uh, mentors and, uh, as an entrepreneur can help you navigate this. The last two things I want to talk about are your exit strategy and, and returnees. So many of you will want to build a business that you can just continue running yourself or um, perhaps that can just continue as an independent private company. Others will want to work towards an acquisition or towards an eventual initial public offering or IPO. These two exits can be more difficult in a developing economy context. If you're working towards an acquisition, then you need to start building relationships with the companies that might wind up requiring you. An acquisition doesn't happen overnight and so you almost have to think of a potential larger company that might acquire your startup as another customer where you're building a relationship with them over time that eventually leads to an acquisition. If you're looking for an IPO then you have to be very careful about keeping good books. You want to be very clean in terms of how you manage the financial records uh, paying all of your taxes and keeping a good, clean, honest set of books is going to make it much easier to have an IPO. And one final word that I want to say to the returnee entrepreneurs. Often in a developing economy you'll have individuals who went overseas for education or work experience and then come back to their home country and see entrepreneurial opportunities. We've learned that returnees often have some difficulty because while they might have advanced technology or connections to international sources of fundraising, they often lack some knowledge of the home market, what customers really want, and how business works in general in, in their home country after being away for a while. So for returnees, it can be particularly helpful to partner and become co-founders with someone who has work experience and who has remained in the domestic market. And so if you're a returnee entrepreneur, then I encourage you to uh, 
uh, recognize your strengths as well as your limitations and find a good strong co-founder who has remained in the home market and knows how to navigate uh, the current business environment. So that's all I had for now. Um, I encourage you to get on the forum and uh, share your experiences with others if you've been starting your company in a developing economy context as this kind of environment has uh, special challenges and hurdles to overcome. Uh, so I wish you all luck and um, all the best in your ventures.